so I hope to provide you with just some really great uh, motivation as well as some tools today to help you move forward in your own personal journey around finance. Um, if you're in a place in life where you're still dealing with maybe some of the things that create backwards momentum in your personal finance, I want to encourage you, uh, if your church has this available uh, through like a um, Dave Ramsey uh, Financial Peace University, anything like that that helps you in the backwards kind of momentum parts of life, get you out of debt, moving on in a good direction. I want to encourage you, get involved in a group that teaches that material. Get involved, even the material is available online. It's great stuff. And what I've found is that there's some really basic things that I'm going to cover in the first five minutes that help you take care of what's in the backwards or the rear view mirror of your financial life. The first thing is get used to living on less than you make, right? Everybody say less than you make. One more time, less than you make, <laughs> living on less than you make so that you always have some savings left over, okay? So that's number one. Number two is to make sure that you have a savings account set up, and the idea is to have that savings account in place to deal with personal emergencies. Now, here's the thing. Emergencies happen as a part of regular life. Everybody say regular life. Emergencies are part of regular life. When you were driving to this conference, probably at least one person had a tire blow out. It just happens. Those things cost money. And so instead of using credit or using debt to solve emergencies, you want to use your savings. And it's okay if the savings account goes up, down, it doesn't matter. As long as you have it there and you use that instead of using debt or instead of using credit. The third thing is this. It's begin to make a plan to pay off those debts smallest to largest, and create a snowball effect as you're paying those off. It's a really simple concept. You list all of your debts on one page. Hopefully you can do that. If you can't, that's okay too. Make it two pages, but on one page. Uh, if it's a lined piece of paper, usually that's about 23 lines. I've seen, it. I've seen it before, so I'm not saying it's impossible, but smallest one on the bottom, largest one on the top. It doesn't have anything to do with the interest rate. It's about your personal habit of getting rid of things where you owe people money. And so you pay off the smallest one first. You take that minimum payment that you used to be paying on that, and you place it onto the next one, and you make a larger payment on that one until you roll up all of your minimum payments onto the largest one, and you pay that off. So that's called the debt snowball in Dave Ramsey's uh, Financial Peace University, and so I want to give him credit for that, but it's really about getting out of debt in that way. One thing I've found, though, is that there's not usually been very much education around building your assets, around understanding the basics of investing, and around accumulating wealth, not just for the purpose of enjoying it, but for the purpose of giving it back in generosity to ministry and being involved in people's lives. And I know that's the heart of every person that's involved in ministry is they want to do something that makes a big impact, and yet they don't really know how to get um, started on that. I want to start with a little story today. Um, when I first got uh, involved in ministry in my 20s, um, I had a mentor at that time that told me it's important for you to begin to invest something. How many of you have someone that mentors you in the area of finance? Anyone up there? Just a couple hands out there. I found it's really uncommon, actually, for people to have mentors in the area of finance. I don't know why that is. Whenever I ask that question, it's only a few hands. And so I'll encourage you to reach out to somebody and say, hey, I'm looking for a mentor in finance, and that that would, person would, could answer questions and give you feedback about your own personal journey. But my mentor said to me, begin to save and invest something for your future. And he suggested, just do like $50 a month. You'll, you'll never miss it. And you're going to wake up in your 40s. I'm now 47, almost 48 years old. You're going to wake up in your 40s, and you'll have a couple hundred thousand dollars. And I thought, how can that be? $50. Come on. I, I probably spent that taking my family out for pizza on a Friday night. How could that be? I probably spent that, you know, in coffee over a two-week period at many different stages of life. And he said, no, you, you will find that you will wake up in your 40s, and you'll have some money that you didn't think that you had, and that money can be available for you to do different things that are priorities to you at that time. And so I want to encourage every one of you to make a plan to start something, to start small. And when it, when it comes to um, investing, there's some, some basic principles that I'd like to teach you today that will really help you out. Um, by the way, here's my email address in case I miss it at the end. I'm happy to answer any questions. If you'd like someone to give you just some coaching tips or even talk about your own situation, please email me, and then I'll, I'll respond to you, and, and we'll get in contact that way. chad.alvarado at thrivent.com. 
So some people think about um, finances, and they ask this question, you know, really, um, what is investing? What is investing? Some people think of it as speculation. Like, oh, I, it's like gambling, you know. I, I'm going to invest in something. I don't know if it's going to work out. But later on, hopefully, it'll turn into something much better than I, what I have. Some people think of it as, uh, uh, as a speculation that way. Some people think of it just like savings. If I just put a little bit of money away, you know, $50 plus $50 plus $50, eventually that's going to add up to something. But investing is actually something more important than that, and it actually builds to something that is a resource to you far greater than that over time. Really, investing is a carefully planned and a prepared approach to managing and accumulating money. You know, all of us are Christians here, so we believe God has created us as stewards of his resources. These are not my things. These are not your things. These are his things, and so we're to be good managers of all of those things. And if we're all honest, there's going to probably be at least one, port, one portion of your life or one part of your life where you can look back and say, you know, with the resources that God gave me, I, I don't know that I was the best steward of that moment of my life. But here's the great thing. It's never too late to create a better pathway than maybe what you have experienced before if you're kind of on the downside of that. Um, some things about um, investing to, that are really important to understand. First of all, the, the effect of inflation. Inflation has the effect of reducing your purchase power, the purchase power of your dollars over time. And since 1914, the average inflation has been right around 3%. So how many of you have a savings account out there? Come on, let me see your hands out there. Savings account, yes, okay. How many of you have a savings account that pays you at least 3%? Raise your hand. At least 3%. Not as many hands, right? Not as many hands. Because you know what? The banks are not paying great interest rates. A lot of people are there, it's like 0.000125. So what does that tell you? Your savings accounts these days are not even keeping up with inflation. Your purchase power over time is being reduced. Let's say you had $200,000 stashed away in your mattress, and in, in your mattress, and it's just sitting there in a cash position. Well, if you were to wait 20 years, if you were to wait 20 years, that would be, have a purchasing power of $108,000. By doing nothing with that cash position, you've now lost almost 50% of your total value. In fact, if you were to wait um, just another 20 years, the purchasing power there would now be um, even less, 59000 So what I'm, what I'm saying to you is that we need to understand what really investing uh, can do to overcompensate for how inflation is working against you. Here's the good news. The good news is, is there's a, a thing called compound interest that works in exactly the opposite way. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk about debt for just a second here. Uh, credit card companies and other debt lenders understand the effect of compound interest. That's typically why their buildings are larger than our buildings, right? They understand that if we can get just a certain percentage of that dollar over time compounded, that they're going to make a great earning out of that. Well, I'd like to get that on your side. I'd like to have that wealth begin to get built in your accounts. And so the average uh, growth of, let's say, $5,000 invested annually at 6%, at 6%, turns out to be about $395,000 in 30 years. Now, if you were to add all that up, it really is um, only $150,000, and so it's a, much, it's a much greater return. In fact, here's a general rule. It's called the Rule of 72, and you can Google this if you want. It's pretty simple. It says 72 divided by the rate of return that you have on an investment is how long it's going to take you to double, how long it's going to take you to double your money. So, um, let's take a look at a couple of comparisons here. First of all, $3,000 annually invested on 6% turns into, over 45 years, will turn into $678,000. $3,000 annually. You know, it's not much. And it just the compound interest is working in your favor. If you were to do that for only 30 years, look how much less it is. $200 and $54,000. And so my encouragement to you is to start now. It's never too late to start. And if you know young people out there, 
tell them now is a great time to start. If you're in your 20s, just please just put something into an account and have it begin to yield interest for you. And, and then if we drop down to 20 years, it drops it all the way down to $120,000. And so 3000 invested annually. Um, for a lot of people, that's not going to be a large sum of money. But early on in life, it can be. Early on in life, that can be actually quite challenging to save that if you're um, spread thin or maybe you're still dealing with some college debts and so forth. So what we want to do is we want to encourage you to find solutions for those things, and we want to encourage you to find um, good rates of return. And I'm actually going to talk to you about ways where you can gain greater than 6% uh, on average over a, a long period of time, and that has to do with your uh, risk temperament, and we're going to get into that here in a little bit. So the first thing to understand is to identify your goals and your time horizon. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's all kinds of investment goals out there, things that you're going to invest in. Maybe you're thinking about retirement. Maybe you're thinking about a significant purchase like a home or maybe a vehicle. Maybe you're thinking about education, um, some kind of special purchase, or maybe just to have some funds available for financial security. One of the things I love about people in ministry and, and our company Thrivent loves to partner with is people who are thinking about building resources so that they can give back really generously to the ministries of the church and also to other ministries that they care about. And so creating that long-term plan to have some resources available. Um, so understanding your goals and understanding the timeline in which you want those to happen. So for example, if you're, if you're thinking, hey, in five years I plan to purchase another vehicle and let's say that's going to cost you $20,000, you, you have less time if the stock market is going up and down, but overall, long term, it's going up, you have less time to handle the downward portion, the dip in the stock market over time. And so the shorter the timeline until you're trying to use that cash, the shorter, uh, the less risk that you want to, to have available there. And so we're going to go through a couple of different options there. The longer you have an investment timeline, the more risk you can afford. So risk tolerance is one of the things that we spend a lot of time talking with you about. And in a few minutes, I'm going to talk to you about different types of investment so that you can get involved in. Um, risk tolerance is the ability to absorb a loss over time. So how many of you uh, remember anything about 2008 when the stock market dipped significantly? You guys remember that? So I have friends that were nearing retirement at that time, and the stock market dipped and cut you know, a huge chunk out of their investments at that time. Now, some of them thought, I need this cash starting like next year because I'm going to retire. And so they freaked out a little bit, and some of them took some money out of the stock market, meaning they sold their stocks or they sold their positions at a lower rate, and they had less cash as a result of it. Now, pretty much no one I knew took everything out, but they sold some of their positions because they needed it for retirement. Um, other people I knew said, you know what, this is one of the downward trends, and we're going to believe that the stock market, which has a 70-plus year history, is going to come back up. Over 70 years, if you were to average out the growth of U.S. stocks, it's been over 11% annually. There are years that it's down. There are years that it's up. In fact, this last 12-month uh, period has been a, a pretty significant up, even though it's been volatile this, this uh, calendar year. It's been a pretty good year overall, but 11% over the entirety of the time. And so they knew it's not going to stay down. It's going to come back up. And you know that if you were invested uh, at the bottom when it bottomed out in 2008, that it's over doubled the value of what you previously had before, uh, after that time. And so a big question is, how soon do you need to start using that cash? And not only that, let's say you have a big retirement account that you've built by the time you're ready to retire. Are you going to spend all of it in the first year? No, right? Are you going to spend all of it in the first five years? No you may be spending a portion of it. And so that's why it's good to think in terms of maybe having buckets of money. This is my first 10 years. Here's my second 20 years of retirement. Here's 30 years of retirement. 
Now think about this as a concept. If you worked until, let's say, age 65, starting in your, in your 20s up to age 65, you work about 40 years, and then now with life expectancy being, you know, more like 95, you're expecting your money now to last for an additional 30 years, right? I worked 40 years, and I want all that money I saved to last 30 years. That's a pretty amazing concept, right? Like, who would think that a certain amount of work could then mean you don't need to do it for all the rest of the time. That's a pretty amazing concept. And so what we want to help you do is to think strategically about how you're going to position your resources so that you can have a nice um, retirement that really has a lot less risk and a lot less fear um, where you're really confident about your, your income during that time. So your risk temperament has to do with can you absorb loss in the market? Can you handle it going down? Now, the average downward trend in the market is less than two years in length. Less than two years in length. And so you have to ask yourself this question. If, if the value of what I owned didn't rebound in two years, could I hang on to it until the value came back up? And most people would say, yeah, I, I can do that. But that's a question you have to ask. Uh, the, length, the average length of an upward trend in the market is more than five years. So you can see there's this bounce back and forth, up and down, up and down. So we want to coach you uh, about when is a good time to make motion. It also has to do with your own personal risk, uh, personal tolerance for risk. And so I think God has made each of us in a unique way. And a, a lot of times when you see a, a, a married couple, typically one is more conservative and one is more of a risk taker. And you know which one you are, right? Right. But you have this sense that, okay, I can handle a certain amount of risk, but all of us have a place where we become uncomfortable with the risk. And so that's important to understand about um, how you are shaped. And I encourage every one of you, when you think about your retirement, when you think about saving for a major purchase, when you think about your investment goals, uh, take the time to meet with a financial professional. Go over your risk temperament. That's a really important part of this planning process. In fact, if you have retirement accounts that are uh, set up and maybe there's even some coaching available for you through your employers, typically they'll give you some choices as to how you can have your retirement accounts invested. I suggest taking those choices and meeting with an independent financial advisor to say, here's my choices Based on my risk temperament, what do you think my choice should be? And they should be able to guide you through that process. But understand your own personal risk temperament. Are you aggressive? Are you moderate? Are you conservative? All of those m will lead you to different kinds uh, of investments. Um, so here are a, a general sense of what kinds of investments that you could invest in out there. You could invest in uh, treasury bills, which are U.S. debt, right? You can invest in, in CDs. You can uh, invest in government bonds, corporate bonds, um, two different kinds of stock, preferred stock and common stock, which both have different uh, options. And then also options and futures, which are the most risk out there. And as I said before, there is a correlation between risk and reward, between risk and reward. And I'm not going to tell you what you should choose from that list, but that's a, a comprehensive list of things that you could invest in that are considered liquid investable assets. Of course, there's real estate. Of course, there's collectible things, other things that have value that you could invest in as well. But when it comes to considering this, you have to understand that risk uh, reward relationship, and you have to understand what it is that you're trying to achieve through your investment. Are you looking for an income that's going to come every year from that? Are you looking for stability? Are you looking for growth? Um, if you watch the news at all, there's a lot of been, been a lot of talk, um, you know, over the last nine months about these uh, stocks they call the FANG stocks. Have you heard that? FANG stocks? Maybe that's only because I'm a financial professional. I hear this all the time. But it represents technology companies, and it's an acronym for Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, these are all technology companies, right? And what it's representing is it's representing stock uh, uh, companies that have a high growth curve in their earnings and in their development. But here's the thing that, that's true about growth companies, growth-oriented companies. They typically haven't been around long enough that they're paying dividends back to you as an income. 
And so if you're a person who's saying, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to retire, I do want to own some stocks, or I do want to own some mutual funds that include stocks, that I don't, that I would like to see some income created from those. Those don't actually pay you income. They increase in value, and yes, you could sell off some of it and create income that way, but the stocks themselves don't pay dividends yet. Those companies are typically reinvesting their profits back into the company, which is causing them to have this growth that's going on. Um, they tend to be some of the more volatile, so they have a higher upside, but they can also have a higher um, downside. So you have to um, think about timing in that. Um, types of investments that are out there, I'm going to go into them a little bit further here. Um, cash alternatives, bonds, stocks, other investments, mutual funds or ETFs. All of those are individual types of investments. And then they have to consider what is the tax treatment of those investments. So let's say you, you know, show up and you're dealing with a financial professional and, they, and you say, you know, I've saved $10,000 and I want to invest in something that's going to grow over time. Help me to understand how I go about that. Part of it's going to have to do with your timeline and part of it's going to have to do with what kind of returns you're hoping to get and your risk comfortability. But the next thing that's going to actually be important is to understand how it's going to be treated from a tax standpoint. Uh, some things that you invest in get taxed every year, and they can slow down the growth of your money. There's really two things that can slow down the growth of your money other than just loss of value. Um, taxes and fees. So as your money's trying to grow into a bigger pool of money, every time it gets taxed and every time there's a fee associated with it, those things slow down the growth. And so you want to ask that financial professional about those two things. How is this treated from a tax standpoint? And how is this treated, uh, how are the fees associated with this type of investment? And so, you know, some people have employers that have 401k plans, or maybe you have a spouse that has a 401k plan. That's treated the same way as an IRA. In fact, if, uh, if a spouse... Uh, or you yourself leave an employer that has a 401k, we typically suggest move that to an independently owned traditional IRA so that you're the owner of it. Whether the company does well or doesn't do well, it doesn't have anything to do with you, you get to own it and it's your own personal investment. But it's a, it's a tax-delayed vehicle. Now, there's also a Roth IRA out there, and a Roth IRA is funded with money that you've already paid tax on. So, for example, you've you know, brought that money home and now you've invested it in something. And why that can be good if you have a longer timeline is because you have more years for it to grow. And remember that first graph I showed you that showed you know, if you have 45 years, it can go up to 670,000, but you've only invested 150,000? That means that 525,000 of that growth is tax-free. That's good news, right? That's really good news. And so if you have a longer timeline, then it's good for you to invest with a Roth IRA if you fit within the income brackets that it's allowed. Um, it's important for you to understand those things, and, and a professional can help you with that a little bit, or you can do some Googling, do some reading. But to understand the tax treatment of what you're invested in, because it will not eat away at your investment. Um, if you're a business owner, you also have some really unique things that you can invest in that's not available to people who are employees of businesses. Um, so if you're a business owner, um, love to, to have that discussion with you or, or lead that uh, to a financial professional who can help you with that. Um, you have some great opportunities as a business owner that uh, just uh, employees don't currently have. <clears throat> so here are some investment options, talking about um, cash alternatives. Typically, they're low risk, short term, and they're relatively liquid. Some examples might be a money market account, uh, might be a money market account mutual fund. Typically, one of the benefits of them is that they're very stable. Okay, they're very stable. This is a great place to have an emergency fund, in fact. You know, let's say you save up some money for an emergency fund and you don't want it to be subject to the stock market's risk of going up and down. Put some money in a money market fund and have it be very stable there. It's a good place to put it. Um, U.S. Treasury bills, very stable. The, the uh, interest rate doesn't change that often, uh, by big percentages at least. So they're typically very liquid. They're, um, they're typically um, predictable. You can plan for them, and, and that's very helpful. 
Um, bonds is the next one as we're going up the growth curve. What are some of the benefits of a bond? Again, it's something that's predictable. A bond is actually a debt instrument. Uh, what that means is that you are being paid an interest rate from a company who has borrowed money from you, right? You're the bond holder. A company has invested uh, and they've expanded and they want to have some debt to help expand their company. And so if you own a bond, they actually owe you an interest rate. And so that's how you can know that it's very predictable. Um, bonds you can buy from the government. You can buy from a local municipality. You could buy a bond that's on a company. There's lots of different kinds of bonds out there. And um, they can be a great portion of your um, investment vehicle. Typically, um, if you're a person who is, um, let's say, moderate, moderate aggressive, or aggressive in your investment temperament, um, it's suggested to have a portion of your portfolio in bonds um, because it helps protect the, the fluctuation in the stock market. So the stock market's going up and down all the time. In fact, if you watched it, the trading, even for one day, you'd see it just going all up and down like this. It's crazy. But a bond tends to be the stabilizing factor in that portfolio. And so it has to do with um, trying to protect you against too much fluctuation in the market. Um, so we have, I think I went through that already. Pays interest regularly, can be traded like any other security. Types of bonds, we went over that. Predictable, steady income. That's one of the things that bonds can be known for. It's great to own them, especially in retirement, um, for uh, predictable income. <clears throat> so I'm going to move on to... Um, stocks for a minute here. If you own a stock, you literally own a portion of that company. So if you go out and you purchase a stock for, from Microsoft, or you go out and purchase a stock from Amazon, you literally own a portion of that company. So as they have earnings and the value of the company goes up, your value as an owner of that company goes up. Equally, if they have a poor quarter or they have a poor year and the value goes down, you literally lose some value in the stock. Now, stocks typically are evaluated and traded based on people's future thought of that company. And so it's not always what's happening right there in that day, but it's sometimes what people are speculating will happen in the next several months or maybe the next several years. And so if you're a stock owner, it's good to look, you know, toward the future more than the past in some of those kinds of things. Um, but some of the, there are some great benefits. It's a percentage of ownership. Uh, earnings can be distributed in dividends. Not all companies pay dividends, but a lot do. Um, and so it's another way for you to get some more cash um, or get some more growth out of your stock um, shares. They can be bought and sold anytime. Um, some of the differences between a common stock and a preferred stock um, are that preferred stock pay dividends before a common stockholder that's probably more complex than we need to cover today. You can own stock of very large companies or large cap, which is short for large capitalization companies, um, or mid cap or small cap. These are all publicly traded companies. When you see mid cap, uh, small mid and large cap companies, they're all publicly traded companies, meaning you can buy a stock in the open market. Um, anything smaller than that, of course, you can't, it's a private investment. You can't um, do it on the open market. Um, but there's different kinds of stock out there. I talked a little bit about growth stock, like, for example, the FANG stocks, companies that are really growing um, and reinvesting uh, their value back into their own company. There's also something out there called a value stock. A value stock is typically something that has, uh, is priced below its current business's value. So, in other words, if you were to analyze what the business's value is and you add up the value of all the stocks that are available out there for that company, it would be less than what you're seeing. And so one strategy that some investors take is they look for a, a stock that's undervalued, believing that they're going to get some more growth through the next market cycle. Um, income stock, something that's going to pay them dividends. Um, blue chip typically refers to larger companies that have been around for a long time, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Intel, IBM, not, you know, companies you've heard of. Uh, often and, and have been around a long time. And then a American depository receipt actually is, uh, it's the way that you can buy a portion of a foreign company on the U.S. stock market. And so that's, a, that's kind of a unique and special thing. 
Um, some of the advantages of stock is that historically they have the highest long-term growth potential. So if you're thinking of retiring or you have a major purchase or something like that that has, let's say, 10 years or more, you have long-term thoughts about investment, it's great to have a good chunk of your money in something that's stock-oriented or at least mutual fund-oriented. A mutual fund is, is really a fund that's made up of, let's say, 150 different stocks in one fund. And so that diversification allows for less risk as a company goes up and down. But it's, it's important to have a, a, a part of your assets in something like that because the growth is really important for the long-term growth of your money. Um, you have ownership rights. There are certain things that you can vote on and be a part of. Um, it also can provide income through dividends and capital appreciation. Stocks are really easy to buy and sell. You can buy and sell them at any point through the day. Um, for example, mutual funds can only be sold or purchased at the end of a day. They, they, they are sold based on the price at the end of uh, the stock market day, whereas Stocks can be bought and sold at any point during the day. So if you see like, you know, the news at noon, you're at your lunch break, and you go, man, it's really up. You could sell it right there if you wanted to. Whereas a mutual fund, you have to wait till the end of the business day to make that decision. Um, downside, poor, poor company performance can affect your, you over a long time as well. Um, there's volatility. There's greater risk to your principal or the amount that you've invested into your performance. Um, so... I'm not going to really go into detail about real estate, stock options, futures, and collectibles today, but those are other things that you can invest in. What I want to finish with really is talking about um, uh, mutual funds and asset allocation, which seems maybe con kind of complex, but I think it will help you to gain value in your retirement vehicles. Your money's pooled together in a mutual fund, and those dollars are used according to a strategy that you pick. So you meet with a financial professional, you find out what your risk temperament is, and then they help you find mutual funds that are producing really good returns for your risk temperament. It doesn't help you if they say, hey, I have something that's the most, it had the greatest gain of any mutual fund this last year, and you're a conservative investor. That wouldn't fit together, okay, because great, greatest gain doesn't match up with lowest risk score, okay? Those things have to kind of match up. Um, you own a portion of all of the securities within that, um, so mutual funds are a great thing to consider. Um, and here's our little graph, again, of the different kinds of things that are out there. So some of the advantages of mutual funds, diversification, that's a biblical principle, don't invest everything into one single stock. That's dangerous. Spread out the value of what you own into many different things. And so that, you know, if one thing loses a great amount of value, it doesn't affect your overall um, investment. So diversification is really important. Um, they can be professionally managed. Uh, somebody actually gets paid to manage that fund. They get to say, you know, what should be in this fund? Um, does it meet our criteria as a company that should be in this fund? Has it performed as well as we thought it would, and is it worth keeping in the fund? What percentage, if, if all the companies in this fund equals 100% of this fund, what percentage should that company be of that? And, and that's a really fun process for those people like myself on a certain end, but it's, it's important for the investor because you want to make sure that that fund is producing with the objectives and with the, the direction that we want the investors to be able to experience. Uh, mutual funds are very liquid. You could sell them every day. Sometimes if you have a piece of real estate as an investment and you've had highs and lows in the real estate market, uh, you've experienced this where I'd like to sell my house or I'd like to sell a piece of real estate, but maybe it doesn't sell as quickly as I would have wanted it to, and so now it's not as liquid. Some disadvantages, shares can fluctuate every day. Portions of fund dollars may be tied up in cash uh, uh, instead of invested. So as the mutual fund grows and earns money, those earnings and those dividends get placed in a cash account. And then periodically, the fund manager buys new shares of the stock that are in it. And so it's possible that you have a, a screaming growth trend and there's still some cash on the outside, and you say, oh, I want to sell. 
and that can be detrimental to your, um, to your investment goal as well. Um, depending on how you handle a mutual fund, it can be not as tax efficient. Um, if they're within a retirement account, like a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA or a 401k, then yes, they can be very tax efficient. Mutual funds also have fees, and I suggest you understanding those. They have fees. So exchange-traded funds are another way to own a portion of a company. They're passively uh, managed, and they have all kinds of tax efficiencies as well. I'm going to skip through that real quick because we're running out of time. Diversification. Here's what a conservative model should look like. Something close to this. If you're a conservative investor and you're concerned about losing some of your principal, you should have probably at least 50% in some kind of a bond portfolio. About 25% should be in a cash or a cash alternative, and about 25% should be exposed to the stock market. That's a conservative person. Their primary objective is to keep every bit of their principal and not lose but just have some small incremental growth. Here's an example of what a moderate should look like. A moderate is a person who is looking for some growth, but still tends to be right in the middle. They're not leaning toward stocks. They're not leaning all the way toward bonds. They're kind of in the middle. They have some timeline, let's say seven to 10 years of growth still ahead of them. Moderate asset allocation would have about 40% bonds, about 10% cash or cash equivalent, and about 50% invested in the stock market. And then an aggressive person would have a much higher percentage of stocks. I've seen it 75, 80. In fact, I even have some investors I know that are 90% uh, in the stock market because they have a long time until they're going to be accessing those funds. The purpose of your money is a really big indicator of how you should have it invested. Cash equivalents should be around 10% in bonds 15%. And those could be reduced even if you felt that you were willing to be even more aggressive. So this is kind of an overview of investing. But to recap, I guess I would say is that you should, when thinking of investing, invest, uh, meet with a financial professional who's properly licensed to do that, that has professional advice on that. I wouldn't go to the dentist and say, hey, I'm going to tell you how you're going to fix my teeth today. <laughs> right? <laughs> you need somebody who... Actually, this is what they do every day, all day. And then secondly, I would say basic financial principles that the Bible teaches is live on less than you make. Stay away from debt as best you can. Most people in this country don't buy their houses for cash, so that may not be possible. That's probably a debt that you know, is acceptable there. But try to stay away from debt as much as you can. And then invest for your future and start something now. Um, in the last three or four minutes, I'd love to just maybe open up for some questions and um, even input. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So an example of a cash or ca a cash alternative would be a money market account or a money market account a mutual fund made up of money market accounts. So you understand the principle of a mutual fund is that you can have lots of different investments within that mutual fund. So there's actually mutual funds out there that are made up solely of money market accounts. So money market account, money market account, mutual fund, um, cash. Um, one I didn't mention that can be tax advantageous is uh, actually um, cash value life insurance. But I would be very careful about using it in an appropriate manner and making sure that you have a lot of other things taken care of before you get tied up into a cash value life insurance policy. But it can be used, yeah. Uh, at what point in the financial life would you recommend somebody coming to you with a financial professional? What fees or expenses are you putting down now? Yeah. That's a great question. A lot of us will do, you know, a meeting or two with people um, pro bono because we're here to help people. And so uh, that would be a question I would ask when you're calling somebody. Um, how I work is I, it's a pro bono experience at first. And if you decide that you want professional help long term, then we can talk. I'll tell you exactly what it would cost. Um, but um, it's oftentimes the beginning. It's, it's not um, expensive. And I would say 
Um, as soon as you can identify a goal that you have, because that's a big part of the conversation is what are your goals financially? What do you want to do in life with your money or with your potential future money? That, as soon as you can identify a goal, I think you're, you're good to, to meet with somebody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, before I came to doing this work, I spent uh, 20 years doing pastoral work, and it's always been an area of passion for me because I know that sometimes, you know, compared to maybe in the regular marketplace, the earning potential isn't as high, and so you have to be really diligent and wise and steward what you have as best you can. And um, I have four kids, I, you know, married four kids, I've raised four kids, so I know braces, I know college, I know all the things that, you know, happen along the way, and um, we do have, um, through the Assemblies of God, we do have some coaching available there, but um, I would say um, it was limited, that's just my nicest way to say that, it was limited, and so I've found um, that working with a local professional is, is better, and of course with technology, we can do a video conference and be face-to-face, -face, you know, like that. I have clients all over the U.S. that I do that with. And so it's just, it's important to uh, meet with somebody to get some advice. Um, and you know what? You can actually search how they're doing uh, on the web. Just, you know, like anything today can be rated or recommended or reviewed, right? You can just search on the web. How is this person? What are the recommendations, reviews? And so it's really easy to find out how brokers are doing, how advisors are doing based on that. Good question. Any other questions or, or even input? Yeah. Just the advice piece. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, typically what that would be, would be called is a fiduciary. A fiduciary has the responsibility to give advice that is in line actually with what they would do with their own money. That's a, that's a legal responsibility, but they're not necessarily creating the trades themselves. And so, um, you know, depending on their licensing, um, like I have that responsibility as well as a fiduciary, but it's depending on their licensing, that would be the arrangement. And Depending on where you're at in your journey, sometimes fee for advice, like being willing to pay something for good advice, but that's like the extent of your economic input is actually a pretty good thing to have because you're not tied to a whole nother series of decisions after that. It's just, I'm looking for the advice, I'm willing to pay for it, and that's what I need. And that's it, right? Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions before we uh, move on? Maybe what I'll do um, just to make this easy is I'll go back to the uh, first slide. So my email's up there. Um, I would love to be a resource to people in ministry because I know how hard you work and uh, how, we, how hard we work. And I know um, that taking time to deal with this is um, challenging because you have a lot of other things going on. Um, one of my mentors told me one time that um, you spend at least 40 hours earning your money during a week you should spend 40 minutes a week making sure that it's been managed well. And that's hard to do when you have so many other things going on, right? So I want to be a resource to you. I'm happy to help. And um, I even believe that we have the opportunity to create a legacy um, through our teaching of financial principles to kids because we can start this with them at a young age and it's a safe place for people to learn. So there's my email address. Um, God bless you. Have a great afternoon.